theme. So I'm going to talk about the utility and limitations of imaging that oligometastatic disease. I'm glad I wasn't doing this talk 20 years ago because the first time oligometastatic disease is used in the literature is actually 1995. And then it wasn't used again for a few years and only in the last decade has the term oligometastatic disease been used. And perhaps that's because prior to advances in imaging technology uh, that I'm going to talk about today, but also the therapies uh, that can be used to treat these, uh, people weren't foolish enough to really believe that oligometastatic disease uh, even existed. Uh, I uh, created a word cloud from this slide uh, looking at the 50 most common words that appeared in all the manuscripts uh, referring to oligometastatic disease. And it was clear that stereotactic radiotherapy uh, was the key player. Uh, surgery, uh, although it's probably still the primary treatment for oligometastasis disease, uh, features much less in the literature. And uh, perhaps more worryingly, uh, survival uh, doesn't feature very prominently at all. Uh, so this is the way uh, we used to stage cancer. I'm told that in the 1970s, a staging laparotomy was the most common indication for abdominal surgery. And uh, CT has really come along and revolutionised imaging of cancer. Uh, we rarely perform diagnostic laparotomies simply to stage cancer. This is a 52-year-old man with abdominal pain. A CT scan shows a solitary adrenal lesion, uh, which could now be referred to as possibly an oligometastasis. The biopsy confirms melanoma. Can we cure this patient? Uh, that's the real question, and that's the hope that we have. Uh, nowadays, we'd perform a PET scan and, and start with a FDG PET scan, and this is what the PET scan in this individual looks like. We inject radioactive sugar, and tumours, or particularly the more aggressive tumours, use sugar as their metabolite for growth, and they light up very brightly. It's a little bit difficult to believe that this patient only has a single abnormality on a conventional uh, CT scan, and we can see the odd places that these metastases are lighting up in the sinus, in the palatine tonsil. We can visualise with quite high confidence sub-centimetre muscle metastases. And when we come down to the abdomen, uh, a gastric metastasis, which was in fact the cause of the patient's symptoms, and the adrenal metastasis, uh, which was thought to be solitary. Uh, so clearly, prior to curative intent intervention in this patient cutting out the adrenal gland, uh, using FDG PET to exclude more extensive metastatic disease is a, a sensible approach. We're able to detect sub-centimetre disease with confidence. We need to remember that we need to do this at baseline. There's a recent randomised trial in the literature looking at the role of PET, FDG PET, prior to hepatic resection and colorectal cancer, suggesting uh, not much of a role for FDG PET, but they performed the PET scan after chemotherapy and not at baseline. And the metabolic activity will switch off quickly. So if you start tamoxifen in a breast cancer, you'll go from a scan like this to a near normal scan very quickly, telling you powerful information that the active agent is working or not, but not very useful uh, for staging. So if you want to stage, we need to do that prior to therapy. This is a patient with a renal cell carcinoma, uh, which you can see on the left, and a oligometastasis in a rib, which was described on CT and MR as aggressive. And the use of that word aggressive uh, seen would imply that perhaps it's rapidly growing and uh, likely to cause problems relatively soon. But this patient was asymptomatic. These were both incidental findings. Uh, should we excise the primary and uh, give radiotherapy to the solitary rib metastasis? Should we acknowledge that this is uh, systemic disease and give uh, therapy such as the tyrosine kinase inhibitor? Or is this patient uh, asymptomatic and we can't make them better with any treatment at present and should we observe them? Uh, we did an FDG PET on this patient and neither the primary renal cancer or the metastasis lights up. And we could look at this uh, PET scan and say PET's not good for renal cell cancer or we could ask what's the PET scan telling us? Is it telling us that this is a more indolent phenotype, not growing, uh, therefore not using sugar as a metabolite? And this patient had a few comorbidities and was observed. And indeed, at two years later, with no therapy, uh, there's stable disease both at the primary and secondary site. Uh, this is clearly not an aggressive lesion, but a very indolent lesion that had probably been there for many, many years. And the FDG PET was perhaps telling us something very powerful in this patient. So not all metastatic diseases are the same. This is a patient with known colorectal cancer who had a solitary pulmonary nodule on CT, which looks morphologically very much like 
a metastasis. Uh, the FDG PET scan showed no uptake, and it was thought difficult to biopsy, so the patient was observed. And after five years, there was no growth in this lesion, and it was declared to be a benign granuloma. Ten years later, the lesion was still unchanged, uh, more confident that this is benign. But the patient actually had a history of a thyroidectomy for thyroid cancer uh, 40 years prior. And eventually, it was discovered uh, that this was a, a thyroid cancer metastasis uh, lighting up very brightly on a radioiodine scan, a very old uh, nuclear medicine scan. Uh, and the whole body I123 scan actually shows multifocal metastatic disease, which has obviously been evolving very slowly over a 40-year period. So metastatic disease can be indolent. There's only, uh, perhaps a false assumption out there that once disease spreads, it must be aggressive. Uh, but with more advanced imaging, we're picking up smaller disease, and it's not necessarily aggressive. And I believe that PET-CT with FDG can help characterise the disease. And in this patient, the absence of metabolic activity didn't exclude malignancy, uh, but it told us that the process was quite indolent. And observation in asymptomatic individuals that can be very informative to work out the natural history of a disease. So this is quite an old tracer, but it's very specific. Iodine only taken up by thyroid cancer. And this is the way molecular imaging with PET-CT is moving. We've got a variety of traces and increasingly more specific traces for particular cancers. This is a patient with a neuroendocrine tumour, an area that we have a particular interest in at Peter Mac. And uh, this is an old type of scan called an indium octreotide scan, which targets the somatostatin receptor, uh, which sits on the cell surface of neuroendocrine tumours. And this scan showed a solitary left supraclavicular nodal metastasis. And on the basis of this, you may choose to excise it or give it radiotherapy, uh, particularly since this was a tumour making uh, uh, hormones, causing the patient adverse symptoms. When we did the same scan, but on the PET scanner, using a new tracer called gallium-68 dotatate, again targeting the same receptor, uh, three days later, uh, we see extensive metastatic disease and clearly targeting of that uh, so-called solitary metastasis that would be inappropriate. So we have over 15 PET traces now in clinical uh, use at Peter Mac, and we're not going to have time to uh, run through these today. Uh, so stereotactic radiotherapy is a particular uh, uh, promising agent for treatment of metastatic disease because it's well tolerated and uh, doesn't cause too much patient morbidity. This is a patient with a solitary lung metastasis as part of a study of stereotactic radiotherapy and 14 days after commencing uh, treatment has a repeat PET scan showing an early metabolic response. At five months, the mass looks a little bit larger on the CT and they query the recurrence, but the PET scan shows no activity, suggesting an ongoing complete response and merely scar with a bit of adjacent uh, radiation pulmonary fibrosis. What was interesting at, particularly about this patient is on the 14-day scan, we visualised a new adrenal metastasis not seen at baseline and a new bony metastasis, which was biopsy proven, and subsequently at five months it regressed. And this is a so-called abscobal effect, where treatment of a uh, lesion with radiotherapy or other modalities may result in regression of disease elsewhere, perhaps through some immunological effects. Uh, so in a sense, perhaps a self-vaccination uh, through self after this tumor necrosis, and we can see an inflammatory response and subsequent regression of these metastases. Uh, so this may occur in some patients, and it's a phenomenon that we don't understand very well. Yeah, but the opposite may also occur. This is a patient with prostate carcinoma, uh, primary treatment over here with radiotherapy, and uh, a prolonged course of four and a half years without any known disease. Biochemical progression at this point, uh, while on uh, uh, hormonal therapy, and a sodium fluoride bone scan at this time point demonstrated an oligometastasis in the scapula, and all other imaging uh, demonstrated no additional disease. Uh, so stereotactic radiotherapy was given to this lesion and PSA dropped rather rapidly over the next few weeks. But subsequently, PSA skyrocketed. And I'm going to change the scale on this graph, the top from 100 to 1,000, to show you what happened after that. There was marked acceleration of disease and the bone scan with, on a PET scanner uh, three months later shows marked acceleration of distant metastatic disease.
And when we look at this curve with a flat line at PSA and really not much, you know, it was a short rise that led to uh, identification of this metastasis and then subsequent therapy, we need to ask whether some of our interventions can actually accelerate uh, metastatic disease. And I'm doing high volume cancer imaging. I'm quite confident that this does occur in a proportion of patients uh, with both surgery and uh, radiotherapy. 51 year old male with a left arm melanoma uh, was having uh, clinical surveillance in the outpatients clinic, which now consists of an ultrasound as well. An eight millimeter node is found and fine needle aspiration shows melanoma. CT scan is normal. The PET scan shows single metastasis in the uh, left auxiliary node and a bony met in the pelvis. Uh, we can look at the intensity of metabolic activity and they're very high at both sites. 41 is a very high number for FDG PET and the similar numbers suggest to us that these are the same pathology and this being biopsied and proven melanoma, I'm extremely confident that this is also melanoma. Uh, the patient was discussed in a multidisciplinary meeting extensively. Uh, they recommended a bone biopsy to confirm this metastasis, which was performed. The patient found that very uncomfortable, but it confirmed metastatic melanoma. And the subsequent MDM plan was to uh, cut this node out and give SABA to the pelvis to aim for cure. And now we're giving this patient false hope. So that was performed. The patient had the node excised. It's described as an R0 resection, clear margins. Uh, the patient had post-operative uh, pain, uh, as evidenced by the fact that on baseline, he can put his arms above his head for the PET scan, which is our normal position, where when he came back three months later, he wasn't able uh, to do that, and he had his arms down by his side. His PET scan at this time point shows multiple new hepatic metastases. The pelvic bone metastasis remained asymptomatic, had progressed slightly, and on the basis of this, uh, stereotactic radiotherapy was aborted, and chemotherapy was commenced. And unfortunately, two months later, uh, there was extensive progression of metastatic disease and the patient died uh, shortly after this. Uh, so this is five months from time zero to here. And I just wonder what would have happened uh, if this patient was observed and then uh, systemic therapy was applied at a later time point. So this, this is the natural history of a tumour from time zero to death with symptoms from metastases occurring here and the symptomatic proportion of life uh, being in red, with imaging, surveillance and intervention, we do have potential to do harm uh, by identifying an oligometastasis, treating it, making the patient symptomatic from our treatment, uh, the patient then develops symptoms from their metastases and survival is unchanged, but the overall period of morbidity for this patient uh, is lengthened. What is oligometastatic disease? This patient has five lesions, one in the lung, one in the breast and uh, two subcutaneous soft tissue nodules. And the literature variably defines as an oligometastasis as one metastasis, up to three, and more recently, up to five metastasis. And I think it's difficult to define this as uh, oligometastatic disease, but the literature would, at least in part. So what are the options for this patient? Uh, he's asymptomatic. He's got a V600E mutation, which we know is sensitive to BRAF inhibitors. We could... Uh, start with metastatectomies, aim for cure. Uh, we could do surgery to excise the lung, then give radiotherapy to some of the other nodules, which could use a combination of surgery and radiotherapy. We could accept that this is systemic disease, use a BRAF inhibitor, or we could use some of the new immune activating therapies that are having quite uh, spectacular results. I can tell you this slide uh, was before these two agents were widely available. Would anyone consider observation in this patient? The patient's well. Uh, uh, is asymptomatic. None of these therapies are going to immediately make this patient feel any better. In fact, they can only make the patient feel worse. They may result in long-term better outcomes and long-term symptomatic improvement. At least that's the hope. Well, this is the patient's progress over two years' time. Uh, the pulmonary metastasis regressed very quickly, as did the soft tissue metastasis. And two years later, the patient is disease-free. Can anyone have a guess what the patient's therapy was? Well, the patient was a bit recalcitrant and he was well. He didn't like coming to hospitals. Uh, so he refused any therapy. This is just uh, observation. So I think we are seeing a changing disease spectrum with some of this sensitive imaging. 
And although we think we understand the natural history, perhaps we don't as well as we think we do. Uh, so in the past, if you had a symptomatic oligometastasis, I think it was very unlikely to see this. Patients invariably progressed and died. But as we pick up smaller volume disease, uh, it's possible, particularly in diseases like melanoma, where there's a degree of immune surveillance, uh, the natural history may be spontaneous regression in some patients. Uh, so this is my uh, sort of summary of imaging oligometastases. I should think we should be cognizant of whether the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic. In symptomatic patients, we should use PET to identify patients with more extensive disease so as to avoid futile local regional therapies. Uh, PET's not always FDG. We have quite an array of imaging traces now, even though some of them are perceived to be expensive and not widely available. Imaging only makes up about 4% of the cancer uh, therapy budget. So the imaging is actually very cheap compared to interventions that follow. In asymptomatic patients, I think PET can be very useful to characterise disease. And if the FDG avidity is low, that might be telling us something profound about the patient's tumour biology. Uh, interventions that follow the imaging may sometimes cause more harm than good, and it's getting the balance of that uh, correct. And I think uh, in asymptomatic patients, mandating a period of observation to, in a sense, weed out the bad players is not a bad thing. And we can debate as to how long we should observe for, but even a short period of observation before you embark on a potentially futile procedure uh, is a uh, worthwhile thing to do. And if we're dealing with patients with very indolent tumours, uh, the outcomes will always appear positive uh, no matter what uh, therapy we use. So thank you very much.